and action. So who are you and what do you do? Well, good evening, Danny. I am Mayor Liz Pendleton from the town of South Windsor. So just super basic, ready? What does a mayor do? What does a mayor do? Oh, goodness. Well, a mayor talks to the clerk of the council every day to check on what is happening on the council side of things um, to make sure that thank you letters are going out or citations are being typed, make sure that um, if there's any questions about any of the minutes that have taken place of our council meetings, um, the mayor sets the agenda for the council meetings. Um, the mayor appears at various events to hand over those certificates, um, the citations or the proclamations. Um, I attend many ribbon cuttings. Um, what else do I do? I speak with the town manager. I'm like the go-between between between the town manager and the town council, and if anything happens in the town, the town manager calls me. Um, The mayor, the council has three distinct jobs, and the first one is to set the budget. The council has a very huge responsibility on setting the budget for the community. Um, Then we also have the job of evaluating the clerk of the council, and we also have the job of evaluating the town manager and, you know, doing his evaluation. We also have the job of hiring the town attorney. That's our, our job as the council. And we approve whatever the town manager needs us to approve to accomplish whatever ta- the town tasks that he needs to get done. Um, on the town side of things with the staff in every department of the, with that the staff is in, and we give that approval with the resolutions at council meetings. So how many people are on the council? Nine. And are they all voted in? Yes. And do they all? What are their titles? We're all council members. However, the um, during an election, the highest vote getter, and it's a gentleman's agreement. Usually, the highest vote getter is the person becomes the mayor with the from the majority party, and the deputy mayor becomes that person becomes a deputy mayor from the majority, the second highest person in the majority party. Yes. Which party are you? Democrat. Why Democrat? Why Democrat? It's a very good question. I'm glad you asked me that. I was raised a Democrat. Mom and dad were a Democrat. Dad was from New York. Um, and years ago, my grandfather was a police officer in New York. But then he be- he was also military. My dad was military. We're extremely patriotic in my family. And um, I was raised in a household that was very giving and very kind and very considerate. Um of others. Our house, our door was always opened for whomever needed help. Um, and, and for me, um, as opposed to with the democratic point of view, to helping others, to being there for others, to not necessarily the um, business driven base, but more of a human type of side of person. And my dad had a huge heart and that's where I learned it from. Um, I believe in the democratic values of our country and being there for our fellow citizens and helping them out and doing what we need to do for our country to, you know, find the best ways of doing things. However, I have to say, I'm a little tight with money. Mm. I'm kind of conservative when it comes to the money flow. So I am the one when it comes to budget time that is always trying to decrease the budget to save the taxpayers money. Um, I truly believe that your hard earned money um, should stay in your pocket. I, I know you have to pay taxes, but let's do the best that we can, get the biggest bang for our buck. Um, you know, I didn't, we didn't start out with a lot, my husband and I, neither did my dad, my mom. Um, so, you know, going up through the ranks of life financially and knowing what it's like, um, you know, in, in how times it struggles for some, you know, and, when I hear about seniors that, um, I'm sorry, I got off track. No, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. So I hear about seniors sometimes that have difficulty with choosing between their medication or their groceries or their electric bill or um, in their medication. You know, that's disturbing to me. No one should have to be able to do that. Um, you know, we should take care of our seniors. They've taken care of us for years. You know, they they raised us and they and we should respect them. Um and I, you know, in, in having the food bank there for them, the food and fuel bank there for them in South Windsor, of which I contribute to, um, every three months I have a case of toilet paper delivered. Um, I'm 96 rolls, you know, so 
um, septic tank free and all individually wrapped and actually a delivery is happening today. So it's a great thing. Um, so whatever I make with my town money, I contribute back to the community. Um, it, it's a great thing just to be able to help others that are less fortunate. I, I think that's, um, I think that's the basis of a Democrat and to, to really focus on equality and focus on inclusion and focus on, um, not so much of a difference of socioeconomics, but to look at everyone as a person and to treat them with respect as such. So if you could break down the democratic values into a few words, what would they be? Kindness, compassion, um, fair, equitable, inclusion. Yeah. So what's the difference between the values of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party? In your opinion, this isn't obviously... I see a division within the Republican Party with um, your socioeconomic status, where there's a division of you know either the business owners or the money makers as opposed to the ones that are, have less of an income. I see that division there. I don't see full inclusion. Um, I see a distinct, there's a distinct, a distinction. Whereas with the Democrats, you know, as far as I know, as far as what I believe or as far as where I come from, I'm not speaking as all Democrats, um, you know, with the inclusion, with the kindness, with the compassion, with the understanding, with being there to help someone that may be less fortunate than us. And if you can help someone because you're in a better financial situation, go for it. You know, what is it going to hurt? You know, and it's only going to make the world a better place. I agree with that. And you put a smile on someone's face. I agree with that too. Yeah. Um, it's more, I'm, I ask out of curiosity. It doesn't affect me in either way. And it's, I kind of like to understand people's point of view. And I kind of like to understand why people choose to do the things that they do the way that they do them. So I'm obsessed with achievement. I'm obsessed with other people's achievement and how they got there and how they did it and why they did it. Mm -hmm. Mayor of a town seems like an achievement that somebody would set out to do. Was it? No. How did you end up there? Many years ago, going back in time, um, I advocated for a teen center in our community as I was a teenager, and I advocated for a teen center, which we had. Um, I believe everyone has a voice, and if you want change, then you should say something. You should do something. Become active. I was raised in a household that was very active socially and in various groups. My mom um, was in the VFW. My mom was part of the American Legion. I was in the American Legion when I was five years old um, in the auxiliary. My mom was the president of the Gold Star Mothers because my brother was killed in Vietnam in 1966. So my mom became the president of the Gold Star Mothers for the state of Connecticut, and in doing so, she went to many events, public events. Um, my father was also in the Governor's Foot Guard Band. So as a child, I was exposed to social gatherings at Elizabeth Park every Sunday or parades, Christmas parades, or any parade that they would march in. They would also go to the inaugural. Um, and in our household, the, the rule was when you hit 16, the girls got to go to the governor's inaugural ball, and I went to El Grasso's ball. So it was really cool to be able to see a strong woman um, who was running our state and to admi I admire her greatly. Um, so I was exposed to that my whole life and to know to be actively involved in certain things outside of our our, our town, you know, in, in, in social gatherings. So I learned to speak out and I've always been outspoken. Um, and then when I graduated high school, it was a choice for me to decide, do I go in the military or do I go to college? And I wanted to become an architect. I wanted to go to RISD. And I sat on the front step with my mom and had that conversation. And being that we're a very patriotic family, um, my mom and I had that conversation. And I went in the Air Force in honor of my brother. Um, and I have 27 veterans in my family going back to the Revolutionary War. And I am a daughter, uh, I am a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, so, which I just accomplished last year. So I was really excited about that. What is that? The Daughters of the American Revolution um, are for the females. They're sons of the American Revolution also. 
but you have proved your genealogy back to a soldier that fought in the Revolutionary War, which I have many relatives that did. And in every war since, I've had relatives that done that. Um, my ancestors came over here from another country um, in 1749. So going forward, they fought in a lot of wars. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it, I, I'm i sorry. That's okay. Phone. Let me get back. It's all good. So um, I do genealogy as a hobby. And um, learning all that in my military family from the background. And my brothers were in the military and my nephews were in the military. And um, my husband and, you know, he's a retired Marine. So, um, yeah, we, ha we have a lot of military history in my family. I'm, uh, my dad, my grandparents, and so on. But you had asked me a question about what got me involved, and that was, and, you know, I believed in our country. And, that, and it wasn't just for my brother, but it was for what I believed in and what I was raised in and, um, you know, believing in our country and fighting for our country if, if need be. So I went in the military, and even in the military, I was a little outspoken in boot camp. Just a little. It was kind of interesting. It was fun. Really, you don't strike me as the outspoken. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm really shy, truly. Really? <clears throat> um, I became a squad leader, which is the first person you have four squads. And believe it or not, I was the tallest one out of the four, which was surprising because I was like only 5'1 at the time. Um, but my drill instructor, I actually went in on my 19th birthday um, and flew to Texas on my 19th birthday. And she was like 6'2". So it was quite an interesting adventure. And I spoke out a little bit in boot camp. But it was all good. In basic training, it was all good. Um, and then after getting out of there, I came back home and got involved with the Patriotic Commission in South Windsor. Again, military connection and Desert Storm and all of that. So um, I was on the Patriotic Commission and decided to go for the town council. And I'm the longest running council member as the and as we speak i've been on for 13 years um yeah so i like it my purpose for being there it's not for myself gain at all i consider myself an advocate for the citizens of our community for the residents for the businesses to do right by them to um help them with the budget or to make something right within our community um, I'm happy that I'm chosen as an advocate. I hope I'm doing a good job. I am a little outspoken, yes. Um, I will fight for what needs to be done correctly. I believe in what's right. Yeah. And I believe in being fair. Fair is good. Yeah. Fair and equal are different. Yeah. People need to remember that. Yeah. The fair and equal are different. It's a struggle for a lot of people to understand that concept, but fair is not equal. Equal is not fair. Um, so you've been on the council for 13 years. Yes. How long have you been mayor? What year are we in? Oh, 2023. 2023. Yeah, okay. I was elected in 2021, I believe. Yes, 2021. Okay, so you're going on three years. This will be year three? Um, no, we're getting elected in November, so it's been a year and a few months. Okay. Year two will be this November, this and we only have a term of two years, so am I running for council again? Probably. You think? Yeah, I think so. You do? I you, do. Okay. Do you think I should? I do. Okay. I do think you should. I'll do it just for you. Okay. No. Okay. It's done. All right. It's done. It's done. Um, did you become an architect? No. However, I've been given a gift of designing houses that just pops in my head, and I take it out of my brain, and I put it on a piece of paper. And on a you know a one inch grid on a piece of paper, and I draw it out, and I have dresser drawers full of house plans, and I've never done that. No, I never went to school for that. What did you go to school to become? What did you become? I didn't go to school actually. You went to the military. I went into the military. I had many jobs, many careers, many jobs. Um, How long were you in the Air Force? I was in the Air Force for two and a half years. I got out to be a mom. Okay. Um, and yeah, I've had many jobs. So I've I went to school to be a hairdresser. I worked at a bank. I've done quite a few things. Quite a few things. I was a certified nurse's aide. I was an EMT. I've done quite a few things in my life. So is mayor a full time job? Twenty four seven, three sixty five. You don't shut it off. 
and it's a paid position. Yes, according to our charter, the mayor is the only one on the council that gets a stipend for being the mayor. And then you use that to give back. Yes. Yes. So then what do you do now for work? I don't. That's what I do. Oh, okay. It's, I work a lot of hours as the mayor. I bet you do. I do. I'm uh, very committed. And it's not for the money. Clearly. Mm. The stipend doesn't sound like a paycheck. Well, it is a paycheck. In a se- it's $75 a month. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a paycheck. That's not a living wage for anybody. No, it's not meant to be. Right. You know, and then that was back when they wrote the charter, you know, many years ago. It's And it isn't about the money. I don't do it. I do it for the love of my community. That's where I was born and raised. And and I love South Windsor. It's in my blood. You know? So you went away to the military for two and a half years. You were born and raised in South Windsor, and then you came back to South Windsor. Well, I'm not going to go through the timeline of where I went and how I did it, but I will tell you that I moved 34 times since I'm at my 35th move right now since I graduated high school. Okay. And it's, we've been in our home for 30 years. It's next year. You've been in your home for 30 years. Yes. Back in town for 30 years. Next okay. Year. Yeah. Traveled so, a lot. What is it about South Windsor that you love? Why do you stay? Why do you get so involved? Well, my parents were still here when we moved back home 30 years ago. Uh, and they were getting older, so we moved home to help them. And my in-law, my mother-in-law, um, family is here. I knew the area. I knew the benefits of our community. I knew um, living there and growing up there and being participating there in various you know, boards or commissions um, and have the school system and moving back. And in just the um, the locality was great um, for the highways or wherever you want to travel to. The um, the people, the people of our community really make it. And I got to tell you, South Windsor has spirit. South Windsor has heart. Um, my husband's a volunteer firefighter, so he went back on to he went to the, join the fire department when we got back home after he got out of the military, and. The the love and the compassion and the kindness and the caring and the giving of the folks in our community is unbelievable. I It brings me to tears in a time of crisis when we come together and we help someone else. I cry hap- tears of joy because everyone pitches in and jumps in and drops off this or brings that or brings piles of baby clothes or, you know, I have shoes or whatever. They, everybody pitches in. And, and our town is unique, I think, in that way where everyone, we're, we are a huge, we're a community, not just a community within it, but we're a community that really supports one another, helps each other out. How many people live in South Windsor now? Uh, 26, close to 27,000. And how many schools? We have, what, five elementary schools? Yes. We just built four new brand new elementary schools. Yes, we have four. We have four brand new elementary schools, and we're building our last fourth one right now, Pleasant Valley. Pleasant Valley, right? Right. Then we have the middle school, and we have the high school. How does that work? How do we have five elementary schools that feed into one high school? One one high school. Well, because you have certain grades at different elementary schools, or middle school, you have one through five, or K through five, at the elementary schools, and the fifth graders go to the middle school. Everybody rotates out. So there's, you know, certain grades in the middle school and then certain grades at the high school. Okay. But I know my class was so big that we didn't fit at the high school at the time for ninth grade, so I had to go to high school. I mean, I had to go to my ninth grade in the middle school because we were so large. And even for sixth grade, after we left fifth grade, our sixth grade class was so large, they divided us in half. Some went to the middle school and some went to school on Main Street at the Board of Ed building, which it wasn't then at the time. It was a school. And you've been outspoken and advocating for new things in the town since high school. Mm-hmm. That's when you started advocating for the teen center? Did you already have one then? or that No, was we didn't. Then? We didn't. That's when it was created. Yeah, I've been outspoken. Even in middle school, I was outspoken a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And I think I had a lot of exposure, too, because we did Bye Bye Birdie, the play. 
and I was part of the the cast behind the scenes, and you know, learn to just be an outs- outspoken person. Define outspoken person. What does that mean to you? To me, um, I guess I could say I speak from my heart. I speak openly and honestly and true to myself. Yep. Um, I'm not, I will absolutely, I, I have a few rules for raising my children or my beliefs on any relationship. And that is, you know, it, it all has to start with self, it's self-respect. I, you have to be self-respecting and then you have mutual respect and then you have trust and you have love. And, you know, I feel that I'm a self-respecting person and I will absolutely respect you. So I will speak open and honestly and respectfully, you know, just, I don't hold back much. Sorry. Yeah. Don't be sorry. Yeah. I don't hold back either. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. Yours. Would you call those your values or your rules? My values. Well, I raise my kids that way. I raise my kids that way, and I believe that way in any relationship. And I, I don't, I don't care who it's with. I don't care if it's you and I, or you know, it, me and the governor, or me and the dog, or me. It, however, it is, I have to be self-respecting. Bottom line, you know, I have to respect myself, and that would include, you know, not lying, not stealing, not cheating, not, you know, I have to be true to myself as a as a real person that has a conscience and. You know, doing the right thing. Right. Mm. Yeah, I have similar. Yeah. I, I believe in five core habits to get through life. And what's those? Self-awareness, personal perspective, empathic understanding, effective giving, win-win. I like those. I'm kind and of if you them. do those in order, you will get what you want every time. I like that. Because if you can be self-aware yeah. and understand how you're feeling and what's going on with you, you can put it aside to get perspective on the situation, which is personal perspective. Okay, this is what's actually happening. Yeah. And then you can empathically understand what's going on for the other person. How are they feeling based on the reality of the situation? Mm-hmm. I can empathically give to them, meaning I can give based on how they feel about something. And then now we're in a place where we can both win. We can both get what we need out of the situation. What if you're... Your empathic piece of things isn't well received from the others. That's the effective giving piece. The empathic understanding is for you. It's not for them. Okay. The effective giving is for them. I'm giving effectively to how you feel. Okay. Right? So I'm understanding how you feel based on the reality. So I believe that words matter a lot. Yes. And I define words very specifically for me because of my mental health situations. And it helped me deal with my crazy for lack of a better word, because I would get triggered by stuff. And I wouldn't understand why I was triggered. I just knew I was triggered. Like, I knew that I was angry all the time. And that meant that if I got angry sometimes, I wouldn't get violent with people, but I would just be a violent angry. I'd break something, or I'd outburst, or I'd scream, or I'd yell. And having the understanding of, you're never angry unless you're hurt. If your feelings aren't hurt, then you probably won't get to angry. But every time you're angry, your feelings are hurt in some way. I don't care if it's a toddler making you mad or it's an adult making you mad. The reason you're angry is because your feelings got hurt. So if you can start to be self-aware of your situation and you can start to understand that perception is the way you see the world based on your emotions and perspective is the reality of what's actually going on if you can get rid of your feelings. And the way to help get to an end result that is satisfying for both people, a resolution, is to understand the other person's feelings, which is the empathic understanding, right? So if I can understand how you're feeling and I can understand that, oh, this is actually what's happening, I can totally see why they must feel that way. Okay, so how can I make them feel better? How can I make them feel good? If I can make them feel good, now I can approach them on what I need or what I think can help resolve the issue at hand, right? I get a lot of shit on my podcast for saying I don't like the word compromise. I I just, I don't think that it has a good connotation to it. I'd like to work from a place of resolution. I feel that resolution means I'm adding to the situation to solve the problem. Whereas if we get into compromise, every definition of compromise has 
a negative connotation to it. And it means that two people resolve a problem, but through concessions. Resolution, resolve, resolve doesn't mean that. Resolve means to definitively find a resolution. We've, we've solved the problem. And I think we're having a really big problem in our country and in our towns and in our relationships right now with the understanding of the difference of a few words. And one of them is compromise versus resolve. And if we can all start to resolve problems rather than try and compromise to a solution that we think everybody will be happy with, we'll understand that fair isn't equal and equal isn't fair. So we can resolve problems for the majority and then we can make concessions for the outliers. We can start to go, okay, this resolves this issue. This is actually a separate issue. Yes, it's similar to this issue, but it's not the same issue. Manic depression is not the same thing as bipolar depression, right? And mental health. So, and even with video stuff, when stuff comes up, they're not the same issue. So we have to make concessions. If the majority are here, then okay, let's resolve this majority problem and then we'll make concessions for all the underlying pieces that might be part of that so we can resolve it in a more full way. I also believe that we are spending a lot of time talking about kindness in the world and leading with kindness. And I don't think you should lose kindness. I just think you should lead with love first. Love is, love is hard. Kindness is easy. And what I mean by that is, I see you're questioning it. We'll talk about it. So why I think kindness is easier than love is because kindness, when you leave with kindness, you just accept something from somebody. You go, well, that's great. I love that for you. Congratulations. That's awesome. Or it's, I'm going to give you this thing. Do you need, you need water? I'm going to give it to you. You need this? I'm going to give it to you. You're just giving and giving and giving because that's, that's kind. Yes, right. Right. That's easy right. to give when you have it to give. Right. But if you lead with love, you teach a person to fish. You don't just give them the fish. Okay. If you lead with love, you're saying, let me help, help me understand what you're going through so I can help you resolve whatever it is you're going through. I'm going to support you through it. I'm going to love you through it, but I'm not just going to give you whatever it is you're asking for. I'm going to work towards helping you resolve it in a way that's more sustainable, right? There are people that we need to just be kind to, right? We talked about the elderly, and we talked about senior citizens, and we talked about how they raised us, and we should respect them, and we should help them. And especially if they're incapable of certain things, like if you're incapable of fishing for yourself, then by all means, I'm going to be kind and give you a fish. Right. That's the difference. Right. But that comes from a place of love because now I can understand that you can't fish. So if I can understand that you can't fish, then that means I can give you the extra fish that I have. But if you're capable of fishing, then I should help you learn to fish. I should. And there might be blockers that are getting in your way of learning that task. But I should do all the things in my power to help you learn those things. And that to me is love. That's not kindness. What about the folks? No, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think it's great. I agree with you. But what about the folks that um, even have difficulty with loving themselves that are not able or capable to love, to be kind? Right. You know, there's some out there that are not loving themselves or self-respecting themselves. Right. And that's what I mean by we have to start at the beginning. It's, it's about starting at the beginning of the issue. I can't have you jump steps. Right. If you can't love we yourself. Very similar. If you can't love yourself enough to get out of bed then I can't expect you to fish. So until you can get out of bed, I'm going to give you fish. But I need you to get out of bed to have the fish at the table. Meet me at the table. Isn't that a compromise? No. That's, that's solving the problem. The problem is, is you're in bed. The resolution is, is you're getting out of bed. I'm not compromising anything by giving you the fish. Right. If, if I don't see it as a concession, then it's not a compromise. Okay. The only time it becomes a concession, oh, the only time it becomes a compromise is if I'm, giving something up as a concession. If I'm giving, that's not a concession. If you're taking, that's a concession. If you and I disagree on something and I say, fine, have it your way, it doesn't matter. But, does, it, does matter. but it does matter. That's the compromise. Even if you say that to yourself in your head, it doesn't matter. That creates the compromise. And this relates to a lot of your life, I imagine, because you work with people that are on both sides of the fence. You have to come to resolutions and resolve things on a regular basis, and you're trying to find the best path to resolve that stuff. And better you than me. I, I, I just, 
I don't want to do it, which most people don't. And that's great that there are people like you that want to do that part. I am all for doing what I do and helping in the ways that I can help in any way that I can. I just am not good at sitting in a room with people that don't listen well. And I feel like sometimes you end up in rooms that of people that don't listen well, and that's where a lot of compromise starts. And when you have compromise, that's where resentment starts. And then I think that right now in our country, we have a lot of resentful people for the wrong reasons. I think that they were fed a lot of information and a lot of things that weren't accurate to become very resentful and they compromised a lot along the way to become this way. Which is also why I think that more people need to focus on their local government mm -hmm. than the national government. And affects you directly. Directly. And immediately and in your face stuff. Right. You know, so that's your backyard. Right. Yeah. And I believe that we can only affect what we can reach. I can't reach the White House. The president is not going to take a meeting with me. The president is not going to sit on a podcast with me. I don't have millions of followers that will make it, quote unquote, worth their time to reach that audience. But the mayor of my town is gracious enough to come sit with me. And I can, this is a way for me to build a relationship with you as somebody in my town and to see if, oh, let me learn. Let me understand. Like, I truly don't know what a mayor does. And, and I imagine if I would have a problem. You can bring it to me and I'll try to solve it. For right. Of course. I give you a solution or, or aim you in the right direction. Yeah. Right. Which is great. Mm -hmm. But it's the idea of I can talk to somebody on a local government level. Absolutely. And other people in town can listen to it and hear it. And I can only touch what I can reach. I can reach those 27,000 people if they let me. Absolutely. Right. I can't reach the millions that are in the country right now. Maybe someday. Who knows? But not right now. And that's okay with me. I'm good with that because I want to talk to people that I can help affect the world around them as well right. in a way that they want to affect it. I don't care what your political beliefs are. I don't care what your morals and values are as long as they're not hurting and harming other people. The moment you start hurting and harming other people is the moment that I start having issue. Same with me. It's kind of got me in sticky hot water sometimes because of that. Yes. And I was vocal about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I like that. And you don't hurt other people. No. No. Not if you can avoid it. Not if you can avoid it. It's... There's always choices. Yes. There's always... Well, I, it's funny. I had this conversation with my daughter last night. Her birthday is next week. So I had a conversation with her. She came out, and I, my stepdaughter goes to her dad's house every other week for the weekend. So she wanted to have friends out for her birthday. And But she also wanted to go out with her boyfriend one night to celebrate her birthday as well, which she can go out with her boyfriend, but I'll be around. <laughs> She's it's only 15. 15? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have, we can talk about it. Um, in my opinion, at 15, I, I think that you're already thinking about boyfriends. You're already thinking about girlfriends. I'm not going to fight the natural course of her world. I'm going to want her to be honest with me and share her world with me. So I'm not going to tell her no. I'm going to give her boundaries and I'm going to help her learn boundaries. And I'm going to help her understand that you need boundaries in all of your relationships. And my boundary is if you want to go out with your boyfriend, then I'm going to be there. If you want to go bowling, sure, I won't be in the same lane as you. I'll be a couple lanes down. You're welcome to enjoy time with said boyfriend. Cool. But I'll be in eyesight. I'll be in earshot because I don't trust boys. I think, boy, I'm a boy. Trust me, I don't trust boys, <laughs> especially at that age. They're just who they are. Um, so I don't, I don't look at it as trying to rein her in and keep her from doing what she's already naturally inclined to do. I'd rather her be open and honest with me and say, hey, this is this is what's happening in my life and we can have a conversation about it and hopefully I can guide her in a direction. But at 15, she's, she's becoming the woman she's going to become and I just have to go along for the ride and hopefully she'll trust me enough to adhere to some of my advice, right? That's my goal with her. But the point of this conversation was, <laughs> the point of this story was last night she got in the car and I was like, I need you to hear my words and understand that I need you to do something a different way. You wanted to go to with your boyfriend this weekend and your friends next weekend. 
well, your sister is going to be at her dad's this weekend or next weekend. So yeah, you should flip them. And she's like, okay. And I was like, wow, that was easy. She's like, well, I don't have a choice. I was like, you always have a choice. You could have chose to, she's like, right. I could have chose to argue. I could have chose to fight. And then I wouldn't be allowed to do either. I was like, well, that's true. That would have been the result of the other choice. And she's like, see, so it's fine. I was like, great. Le- lesson learned. Whereas two years ago, that wouldn't have been the reaction. Two year, like, So that's what I'm working on with her. I'm working on helping her see that she has choices. She just won't like the result of all the choices. Well, that's that's similar to what the way I raise my kids is life is about choices. And you have to make the right choice so you don't hurt yourself or others. Right. And if the choice where she didn't want to change, then she would have hurt her sister. Right. So someone would have gotten hurt, you know, so you got to make the right choices so you don't hurt others. Right. Agreed. So it's very similar. I think we are. We are. Um, And we're both outspoken. We are. So you were in the the Air Force? What did you do in the Air Force? I was at Head Headquarters Electronic Security Command. What is that? It's no longer there. It's no longer a command that's active. Oh, okay. We were the silent soldiers. Just top secret stuff. Oh, okay. Look at you go. So you have kids though, right? I do. How many kids do you have? I have a daughter and a son, and my daughter passed away unexpectedly last year. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. And we have two granddaughters from my daughter. Yes. How old are your grandchildren? 21 and 18. And then you have a son? Yes. How old is your son? 32. And your grandchildren are 21 and 18? Yes. My daughter was 38. Oh, okay. Uh, I've thrown from the loss of your daughter. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. To you. No, it's not that. It just changes my my conversation a little bit that I was uh, to track. Um, that's a hard thing to go through. It is when it's unexpected. Yes, it is. Can I ask how she passed? You can say no. Medical. Okay. I don't... I'm very sorry. Thank you. That's a lot. Yeah. I'm in that club with a lot of other folks that have lost a child, and yeah. Yeah, you don't ever want to be in that club. No. Mm. No. No, I hear it's one of the worst clubs to be in. It's not supposed to go in that order. No. 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 Besides yourself grieving, you know, I had to worry about the children. So that was my main concern. Why the girls? And are the girls. And how are they doing? They're doing okay. They're not great, but they're doing okay. They have their moments still. Do they live in South Windsor as well? Yes, I actually raised them. You raised them? Yes. Dad's not in the picture? Or dad's around but struggling? No, no. They dad was one dad was in the picture, yeah. Yeah. They have two separate dads. Oh, okay. One dad was in the picture, yeah. Oh, okay. And then, you know, took them both. It was fine. Yeah. Oof. Um So they're are they in college now? They- no, not yet. Not yet. Taking some time off trying to figure out what we're doing in life. Yeah, but it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's it's a journey, man. Life. Yeah, <laughs> it's a journey. You know, it's, sometimes it takes a few years to figure out what you want to do. Sometimes longer. I've, I'm still figuring it out. I think. Okay, you keep on rocking it. I think so, right? I mean, you know, you've done a lot of Jeff and Jobs. You said, oh sure, right? Oh, I didn't. I didn't become myself until probably about thirty two, thirty three. I didn't become me. Where I was, you know, at 40, I felt all grown up. I I felt real then. You know, it's like, it takes a while for some folks, you know, and to become their true selves or see who they truly are. And I was like 32. What happened at 40 that made you feel like you arrived? Well, I felt like a, a woman. Like I was a full-fledged lady then. Yeah. You did? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Like I wasn't feeling like a little kid anymore, you know? I wasn't, but now I'm all grown up at 40. Yeah. It's funny how that happens, right? Yeah. It there becomes a moment where and now that I'm at the age I'm at, which I just turned here in January, which we're not going to talk about. Happy birthday! Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm not feeling that age. No, Mm-mm. I'm still feeling closer to forty. That's good. It's a good thing to feel. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Um. Do you remember the moment where it changed for you? 
where it was like, oh, I feel, I feel grown right now. This is, this is where I'm at. Maybe a few days after my birthday, like, yeah, I went, wow, I'm all grown up now. Yeah. Yeah. The 40 part. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I have imposter syndrome sometimes in my 40s. Yeah. Because I'm 43 right now. I'm going to turn 44. And sometimes I go, oh, wait, am I really this old? Am I really this far along? Did I, yeah. is this really my business? Is this really me doing this stuff? Yeah. Well, maybe at 45, I'll get a grip. You know, you'd be maybe. Like, yeah. Boys develop slower. They do. I'll give you till 45. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, but definitely adopting my daughter changed my world. That that made me grow up fast. And then that's when I got diagnosed with all my mental health stuff that was clearly affecting my world aggressively for my 20s. But, yeah, there's just a... There becomes moments in our life where things occur... And we go, oh, I'm by myself. I have to take. I have to take care of this. This is my responsibility. I have to do this thing now. And I feel. I think that's how I parent. I think I parent my daughter with the knowledge that someday she has to take care of herself. Oh yeah, yeah. You have to give them life skills. Right, but I watch a lot of parents now that don't do that. Not all of them. Mm. I don't want to throw everybody under the same, but I, I do see some where they don't they don't hold their kids accountable mm. for things, and it becomes this this weird moment of people get mad at me when I hold my daughter accountable, and they're like, oh, "Well, what if she doesn't want to do that?" And I'm like, "She chose it. That's not up to me. She chose to be part of this team, or she chose to be part of this activity." She has to see it through because she made the choice. She can stop doing it after this, but she has to she has to be accountable for what she chose. You don't get to just quit on people. Like you chose to do this with a group of people. It's not like building a puzzle by yourself in your room. That you can quit whenever you want. It, that's your puzzle and it only affects you. But if you decide to do a puzzle with your friend or your or your somebody else or okay, then you quitting affects them. So you have to come to a mutual decision that you're both going to quit the puzzle. Otherwise, you're leaving them high and dry, and that's not fair to do. Or you have to ask their permission of, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. Are you cool with me bagging out on this? That's like, a choice. Right. Like, you have to have a conversation with somebody to let them know, like, hey, this is what we're doing. Are you in or are you out? And I think that it's a vital life skill to understand that when you're involved in something like you as mayor, you can't just kind of walk away from it. I mean, you could, but it would leave a lot of people high and dry, I would imagine, right? Never. I'm in this 150%, 24-7, 365. I'm very committed. I wouldn't walk away. No, never. I've made that. It's a choice. It's a decision. And it would be very hurtful to some. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, and all the people that voted for you, like you have, you said it's a gentleman's agreement for you to become mayor based on who gets the most votes in the council. Right. Which means the majority voted for you, which means you'd be letting down the majority of the people in the town. I couldn't do that. Right. I could that would I couldn't do that would break my heart. I I just I couldn't do that to anyone else or nor myself. And where did you learn that? Do you think that's nurture or nature or combination? Combination, I think. A combination. A lot of nurture. Yeah. And life's about choices. What did your parents do? My dad was very interesting. My dad was from Queens and moved to East Hartford and then moved to South Windsor and bought a house here in 1956. And just today I went down the street that I grew up on and I spoke to the person who owns my mom and dad's house. He was the first person to buy a house on a street and the third person to move in. Um, so I knew the neighborhood well. It's a very small street. Um, my dad was a baker, and my dad um, also drove tractor for the um, tobacco companies in the summer on the weekends. And my dad was also a tuba player, so he was in the Governor's Foot Guard Band. But he also played in a German band on the weekends, so I was raised at beer festivals. Um, it was a great thing to learn as a kid, uh, the German music, the dancing. Um, just life skills again, you know, you make that choice 
you know, I was taught life skills growing up, you know, and making the right choice to go to the restroom by myself and come back by myself when you have a lot of people, adults around drinking. Um, a very good experience. And so my dad did that, and he was a baker, as I said. So he um, he did that. My mom didn't work. My mom was from the South. So, um, yeah. How did she end up in Southern? My parents met in Florida. And then they came back to South. My dad already had a house here in town. Oh, okay. So they came to South Pennsylvania. She came with them. And interesting stories. I have. Yeah. I do. Lots of them. Lots of them. I want to hear as many of them as I can. And then you grew up in South Windsor. I did. And how many siblings do you have? Five brothers and two sisters. Big family. We were also foster family. Oh, were you? Yes. So we, yeah, yeah. On my street, there was a lot of kids back in the day, 60s and 70s. There were a lot of kids around. Everybody had large families, and yeah, it was a great time, you know, playing out till it got dark and the streetlights came on, you know? And how many of them were fostered and adopted, and how many were biological? Everybody's biological, okay? Biologically related to your parents. Yeah, they all are. We all are. Okay. Either they were their other marriages. Oh, okay. Um, and then mom and dad got married and had me. Okay. Okay, so I'm the last of the bunch. Um, the foster baby we had for five years. But we had so many children that they gave them to a couple that didn't have any children. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was, a, that was fun. Yeah. Have a little brother for five years. Still looking for him. Are you? I am. I am. Because I do genealogy. But he was adopted, so it's a sealed record. I can't find out who adopted him. Um, Is I, it still sealed? Yeah. Yeah. I contacted the state. The, the The best thing I can do is put a letter in his file and hope that he would um, go and look in the file because um, I have his shot record. I have his baby toys. I have his baby clothes. Um, I have baby pictures. You know, I'd like to find him. He was in my life for five years, you know. How old were you when he was in your life? I don't know the age difference, to be honest with you. Maybe... Maybe eight through thirteen, maybe. Okay. That was maybe eight through thirteen. And he was a baby. Yeah, yeah. Until he was five. Yeah. Yeah. Fostering is an interesting thing. It's fun. It so fun. I have, I have five brothers and a sister, and they're all adopted. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Same parents. It's a good thing. Can be. Are you biological? I am. I'm the one biological of seven. Um, yeah, my parents decided that they wanted all the kids that were out there to have, I guess. They're like, yeah, let's just take them. Let's just bring them in. I um, wanted 12 kids. You wanted 12 I kids? I did. But it's great. I didn't have 12 kids. It's all good because I ended up with the 12 kids either through my daughter's friends that used to come over or my son's friends that used to come over. So at any point in time, I'd have six plus my own plus... You know, I had a household full of people all the time that I'd be feeding, so it was all good. Yeah, I like them around. I just like them to go home. The end. Go home. And at the end. Or like when I'm tired, I get the kids go, you should go to your house. You could take mine with you, but you should go to your <laughs> house. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I never, I think I always thought about being a dad eventually, but I never wanted to be a dad. Okay. And then my niece needed somewhere to be, and then she ended up with me, and then I ended up being a single dad for many years. But I don't actually talk to any of my siblings now because they're not, they make unhealthy choices for the most part. So there's that. I think that when you have that many adopted kids, it can be hard. I think it, I don't think there's enough love to fix trauma alone i think there's other there's other things that need to happen to fix trauma and if you're not willing not that my parents weren't willing but i don't know that the kids were willing to do the work to fix the trauma that they had from their previous world great and i mm -hmm. think that it's the the first two years are very important um, you never realize until you get older how important the first two years are the first two years of life yes yeah. Yes. They're, they are literally the 
And I used to think that nature beat nurture, right? I used to think that nature, what's in your nature is in your nature. And then somebody was like, oh, but what about the first two years? And I was like, oh, I guess that's true. If you're not nurtured correctly in the first two years, it's not nature that takes over. It's just the lack of nurture that takes over. And it's lifelong if you don't do the work later. Like there's something about holding an infant and loving infants and loving babies and making them feel safe that changes their entire course of life. And I wish more people understood that. I wish more people understood that they're not talking to you, but they're definitely communicating with you. In some form or fashion, yeah. In some yeah. form or fashion. They, right. And they're very much in need of you. Mm-hmm. And the I, like, there's so many different ways to parent. And there's... Well, isn't like the first three years of life are like the most important? Yeah. It, well, it's also the fastest learning and fasting growing years of your life, too. I love the ages between three and five. Because at three years old, the world starts to make sense. They start to, and it's great because they make you see the world through the eyes of their eyes, and they may see a beautiful flower or butterfly that you would just walk right past, and they see it and they point it out to you and it makes you stop and look at the world in a different view. I love that age. I talk about it all the time. I love teenagers and toddlers. They are my favorite type of assholes. No. <laughs> they are the best version of assholes you will ever find. <laughs> they are not interested in what you have going on. They're interested in what they have going on. And their, they, world's. and their world is is just so small mm. and so specific. Mm. And they're trying things even though you're giving them advice. Sometimes they'll take it and they'll go, okay, I trust that person. I shouldn't do this thing. And sometimes they go, <laughs> bullshit, I'm going to touch it. And they get hurt or something happens and they go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And, you, and it's not an I told you so. It's a, see, I told you that this was going to happen. That's the cause and effect. You should have done this and it's the same and that's where I'm at with my my daughter again now because she's in teenage years those middle years I'm not a huge fan of because they're mimics they spend all their time trying to mimic everybody and it's kind of annoying it's not it's not not fun they don't make choices in those middle years but they do as toddlers and teens yeah they make they're very specific on their choices in those years right right. they're very specific on I'm gonna do this thing even though you've told them something different right and it and I think in those those years, the toddlers and teenagers, if you can be a guide and not overbearing, they learn to be so independent and they learn to love themselves so much because of their abilities. Well, they accomplish more. Right. And and they feel self-empowered because of the choices that they've made and their growth that they've accomplished with right. those choices. And that's exactly what I love about this part of my daughter's life with the whole dating her boyfriend thing. Like a lot of people are like, oh, she shouldn't date. And I'm like, yeah, she shouldn't. I wish she would wait till she was 16. But if I tell her no, then she's either just going to do it at school or she's going to sneak and do what she, like I'm going to put her in a situation where she is going to be immoral. She's going to decrease her values to get what she wants. Whereas if I just let her have this thing that doesn't really affect me a lot for her to have it, if we put boundaries up, and we say, okay, you can do it, but here's the boundaries and here's the expectations. Now she can learn within those lines. And if she falls outside of the line, at least I can bring her back in. Well, and the best part is if you're pointing out the choices, okay? Right. And you're saying, here's the boundaries, here's some of the choices, these are the consequences. Or, you know, the choices that you make all have consequences, but make sure that whatever you choose doesn't hurt yourself or hurt someone else. And then it goes back to the self-love and the self-respect. And you have to be self-loving and self-respectful. And I raised two girls or three girls, so I know what that's about. And even my son was self-love and self-respecting. And it, and it has nothing to do with um, their sexuality or anything like that, but it has everything to do with you as a person, as a human being. Love and respect yourself. You deserve that much. Love